Now you remember now the way Satan approached Jesus with his temptations was similar to the way he approached Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Because he misquoted the Bible, misquoted the word of God to Eve when, when God said to Eve and Adam, do not eat the fruit. Satan lied. He added to what God said. So he misapplied. He, 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 he presented a heresy to them. Says, didn't God say the day you touch, you know, misapply. Misapplying the word of God is what seems to be common among popular Protestant preachers and teachers of the word. Hence the reason why Jesus says, in the last days there will be false Christ and false prophets, false teachers, false preachers. And what makes them false is because they misapply and misinterpret the word of God. Now, I need to take you to a major event that took place during the history of Christianity, known as the Council of Trent. The Council of Trent. You may have heard of this council, but have you taken the time to look into the details of the Council of Trent, of Trent to find out what was the main point of debate, midpoint of concern, what led to such a conclave, what led to such a, uh, a, a coming together of the key theologians and thought leaders of the day and time residing in the Catholic religion because Catholicism was the center of Christianity during the Middle Ages. The Council of Trent held between 1545 and 1563 AD. The Council of Trent led, was held between 1545 and 1563 AD. The Catholic religion literally fulfilled what Christ said. Christ said in the last days there will be false teachers and false Christ and false prophets. They literally fulfilled that and we're going to see how. The Council of Trent was prompted by the Protestant Reformation described as the Counter-Reformation. It was the Protestant Reformation that brought them together that led them to respond to the teachings of the Protestant churches because the Protestant churches, the Protestant Reformation began to expose or did expose the corruption, the doctrinal corruption that was prevalent within the teachings or the catechism of the Catholic Church. So when the Council of Trent came together, there was the debate between tradition and scripture. As the leader of Christianity, every doctrine of the Catholic Church had and was based solely on tradition rather than on scripture. So there was a big problem. The problem was, what are you going to hold on to? Are you going to hold on scripture or are you going to hold on, or are you going to, hold on to tradition? So in that council, the, the Council of Trent decided to hold on to both scripture and tradition. And in some cases, they exalt tradition above the Holy Scriptures. So when the Council of Trent accept both tradition and scripture as a rule of faith and conduct, and truth, in most cases, they exalt tradition, human tradition, above the Holy Scriptures. Complete departure from the Word of God. What was the Protestant response to the Council of Trent resolution? The Protestants' disagreement with the Council of Trent came through three main points. There are several, but I'm going to share with you three main points. The Protestant decided to endorse justification by faith alone, sola fede. Sola fede. The Protestant Reformation decided to endorse justification by faith, sola fede, apart from anything including good works, a position that the Catholic Church condemned as heresy. Catholic Church condemned justification by faith as heresy. In fact, the Council of Trent even issued an edict uh, 
stating that they pronounce a curse upon any church that will accept justification by faith, and they claim it to be anathema, anathema, you know, blasphemy against the Catholic hierarchy because the church reject human tradition and embraced scripture and placed scripture above human tradition. That was the Protestant Reformation position in response to the Council of Trent. Number two, the Protestant Reformation rejected the Apocrypha. The Protestant Reformation rejected the Apocrypha as part of the biblical canon. You need to understand that the term Apocrypha comes from the Greek word, means hidden, hidden. It is a collection of ancient Jewish writings and is the title given to these books, which was written between 300 to 30 BC before Christ, in the era between the Old and the New Testament known as the intertestamental period. So that was the time the apocryphal, the Jewish apocryphal writings the, known as hidden books were written. The Bible is never considered hidden. God wrote the scriptures, allowed the prophets to write the scriptures so that it would be made known to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. That has been God's plan from the beginning and will continue through the end. So the Protestant churches rejected the apocryphal books. It is important to note that many doctrines unique to Catholicism, such as the teachings of purgatory, prayers for the dead, and salvation by works are found in the apocryphal books. Hence the reason why the Protestants had to reject them. So today now, as we looked at the tension between scripture and tradition, the appeal that God is sending to us through this platform is for us to choose scripture above human tradition. We have to make the decision that we rather serve God like the early apostles did rather than man. Jesus gives the criteria upon which we must follow the scriptures. For these are they which testify of me. Any written instructions, whether it be catechism or some church dogma that, that exalt man above the Bible must and ought to be rejected, my friends. Human beings must never be worshipped. Human beings must never be idolized. Only Jesus, only Christ. He's the one who died on the cross of Calvary for our sins. And so therefore, when we proclaim Jesus Christ, when he says, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. Jesus says, search the scriptures for in them you'll have life eternal for these are they which testify of me. David says, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Jesus again says, in the last days, men would rather darkness than light. And as a result of human tradition, Protestantism today is no longer protesting against the corruption of doctrine or the corruption of scripture. Protestantism, modern Protestantism, have acquiesced and coalesced with uh, the doctrinal teachings of, the, of Catholicism, and they have embraced tradition over scripture. And there are many doctrines that are being taught in Protestant churches today that are not soundly based on scripture. Let me repeat, there are many doctrines within Protestantism today that are not soundly based on scripture. They are more, they are more tradition rather than scriptural. And so we are at a cross heirs with what a man teaches and what God teaches in his word. My dear friends, praying for the dead, that's not based on scripture. Most of the times you attend Protestant funeral services and they talk about how their relatives who have died, their loved ones who have died are listening. They're up in heaven. They're watching over them and all of that. You have heard this. I don't have to go through the details. That is not based on scripture. The Bible says for the dead, no, not anything. And so therefore, when... Even when uh, Lazarus had died, Lazarus did not know that he was, he could not relate to any questions uh, while he was 
in the death the, while he he, he, died, he while he was dead why because the dead know not anything and so therefore my friends the teachings of purgatory purgatory is not based on the bible it is from the, the apocryphal books the apocryphal books were never endorsed by jesus nor of the nor by the disciples jesus says the scriptures are the law the prophets and the psalms which takes in consideration all of the old testament which ended with malachi so therefore the disciples nor jesus christ endorsed the apocryphal books not only that but we find sunday observance sunday observance is not biblical sunday observance came from paganism i mean the catholic church acknowledge and admit that and most honest protestants will tell you the same but the seventh day sabbath which is saturday from genesis has been consistent you go and ask modern Judaism today, and they will tell you there's no debate. There's no debate. There is consistency of scripture, consistency historically that prove that the Sabbath has never been changed. It has remained consistently on Saturday and not Sunday, the first day of the week. So now we find um, many of the other teachings that have infiltrated Protestantism today um, contradicts the Bible. And I'm going to conclude with two, three passages of scripture. Number one, Jesus says in John 5, 39, search the scriptures for in them you think you have life eternal and these are they which testify of me. Luke says, thou opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. Luke 24, 45. Acts Chapter 17, verse 11 says, These were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily. Acts 17, verse 11. The apostle Peter says, Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth, forever. First Peter chapter 1 verse 23. And lastly, John the Revelator says in Revelation chapter 1 verse 3, blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy that is the one written in Revelation and keep those things that are written therein for the time is at hand. My friends, may God bless you today. May God open your mind to the deeper understanding of his word. And may God continue to enlighten you and to give you the desire to know the truth. For, the, for those who know the truth, the truth shall set them free. So I conclude on this note so that Pastor Barnaby will entertain your questions and we will walk you through what has been presented to you this evening. Praise God, praise God. Thank you, Pastor. I want to uh, start to unpack uh, the great information that you shared with us by focusing on two words, tradition and scripture. That's right. Tradition and scripture. Will these two words summarize where we are, what you presented to us in a nutshell? going back to what jesus says in the last days there will be false christ and false prophets and what defines truth from error is the correct methodology of interpreting the word of god if you do not use the correct method of biblical interpretation you will arrive at a false conclusion and when you arrive at a false conclusion or false, false teaching will emerge. And therefore, the person who preaches or teaches false in false doctrine is essentially a false prophet or false teacher. And that's what Christ says is going to be rampant in the last days. And what has happened now to us and what we are seeing as a reality today is the exaltation of human knowledge, human wisdom, and human science above the scriptures. And so the choice now people make is what seems to be more 
more, more appealing to them. Uh, what seems to be more appealing is human tradition, human knowledge, rather than the say of the Lord. In fact, the reason why, Pastor Bonaby, most people choose, they rather choose human tradition above the word of God, because human tradition um, pacifies human error. It embraces human error. You, human tradition embraces falsehood and sinful lifestyle. You know, human tradition will not rock the boat. Human tradition will pat you on the shoulder. Human tradition will give you a nice warm hug, so to speak, and tell you what, where you are is okay. What you are practicing is okay. The day you worship is fine. There's no problem. That's what human tradition will teach you. But the word of God will tell you, no, thus save the Lord, for I change not save the Lord. Indeed, and in, in truly uh, appreciate it. I, I also want to come back to the two methods of studying scripture. Um, one, um, in using a layman word, is proof text, and, which is the, um, the historical uh, biblical Dramatic. interpretation. And the other, which is the higher criticism of putting our own, our own thinking on the scripture. So, t t do me a favor, please. Give us the most simple definition of the historical um, biblical interpretation of scripture and contrast it again, if you may please, with the higher criticism, which is hit at the heart of what you're trying to communicate with us. Well, first, um, the proof text method is what the prophets and disciples of Jesus used when they were studying the Bible. They allow precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little, there a little. They look at the agreement um, of the different passages of Scripture, how they agree with each other. They look for internal evidence, and they go by the weight of evidence. All of these collaborated and cooperated together, bring together the proof text methodology. Um, the other one, which is the higher criticism, what they did was they began to critique the word of God using human wisdom to decide what is true and what is false. In other words, they put human wisdom under the microscope. They put, they put the Holy Scriptures under the microscope of human... They put the Holy Scriptures under the microscope of human wisdom, and then they exalt human wisdom above the word of God, which is essentially what the Catholic Church handed to them from the Council of Trent by taking tradition as the higher standard, as the measuring standard. This is totally wrong. You cannot subject the word of God to human tradition or to human wisdom because God is about man. God is the one who created man. How could man be wiser than God? And by the way, there is a passage of scripture that says that men will think that they are wiser than God in, in the last days. And that's what we are seeing. So um, the scholars now, I mean, they, they came up with the marvelous way of critiquing. And you know that when we were at the seminary, we were st studying this in detail um, with, with um, fellas like um, Westcott and Horton, Astuk and um, Rene Discard and all of them, you know, who... Um, and, and with, with the, uh, the, the, the turn of the, the, after the period of the Middle Ages, the turn of the century, which brought in or ushered in um, the Enlightenment, the period of Enlightenment. During that period, man began to reason and they accepted reason. You remember that concept, reason? They began to accept reason above scripture. They reasoned above the word of God because they see man as... Um, they see science and technology as infallible, concrete, um, impeccable, you know, um, way of dealing with life and with matter and answering the questions of human origin. And then we find even the theory of evolution and Darwinism and all of them begin to espouse and begin to bring about a new method of looking at life. And so in order for modern Christianity to agree with science, they had to accept some of the putrid or corrupt um, method of looking at scripture. Indeed, I appreciate it. As you mentioned, Darwin, um, our scientist, Dr. Payne, often brought to our attention that Darwin was not even a scientist. He was a philosopher. 
And at so doing, he was the one who, who reasoned in the same context of what you, you are saying. So tell me a little bit more about the Council of Trent and, and that established between 1545 to 1563 AD. And, and how is this now help this council tradition help to facilitate, for example, even Sunday worship. Uh, let's look at it as the Christian community. Uh, we often talk about um, on the show that we have approximately 8 billion people currently living on planet Earth, approximately 8 billion of us. We have uh, approximately 3 billion Christians. We have approximately 2 billion Muslim. 2 billion Muslim, 3 billion Christian, and another 3 billion that does not um, uh, be a part of this, these two dominant f f faith. So my question to you now, coming back closely to what you just shared with us here, in respect to tradition over scripture, again, tradition over scripture, where we have Sunday worship, for example, uh, most of the three billion Christians, most of us does not even recognize that the Sabbath still need to be kept. And so tell me how does the Council of Trent help to facilitate and contribute to so many of us even who are Christian today that does not keep the Sabbath? You know, the Council of Trent essentially was a counter-Reformation effort to stop the spread of the Protestant Reformation and also to, to, um, to corrupt the teachings espoused by the leading Protestants at the time. Of course, you know, Martin Luther, Calvin, and the others, they were the leading proponents of Christian theology within Protestantism. So you, you find that during the, pro, during that, um, during the Council of Trent, um, many doctrines unique to Catholicism, such as the teaching of purgatory, prayers for the dead, and the salvation of works, um, were found in those books, and they decided to add those books to the canon, add those books from Revelation going forward. So the Protestants claimed that only um, these only the, the only source and norm for Christian faith was the Holy Scriptures and um, that the Holy Scriptures had closed, the canon closed after Revelation. And therefore they reject any other source. Um, the Trent, the Council of Trent uh, met and they affirm that the two sources were equal, tradition and scripture. Okay, so they exalted tradition on the same level and sometimes even above scripture. So that theology now that is based upon those two systems corrupted Christianity even more, even further. In the Catholic theology, for example, let me give you just another example. The doctrine of indulgences is a remission of temporal punishment due to sin the guilt of which has been forgiven on the Catholic teachings, every sin must be purified either here on earth or after death. So even though other person died, then that you could still pray for that person. That person could receive absolution of forgiveness by the Catholic Church. It was then that Luther, Martin Luther, appealed his sermon, um, denounced this when uh, a Catholic priest by the name of John Titzel who said, as soon as the coin in the coffin rings, the soul from purgatory springs. <laughs> so, so Martin Luther, he, he, he denounced and rejected Tidzil's claim. And Tidzil, you know, was making a bundle of money from the pockets of poor peasants who, was, who were concerned with the death of their deceased relatives. And then this guy who was a drunkard had a piece of paper in his hand and he was singing in the streets and, and he had this paper. And what was that paper he held in his hand? It was 
the purchase of absolution. So he don't have to worry about life after death because he's, he has been, he has paid for his salvation. You know, these are the things that corrupted the, the Catholic Church. So the Catholic teaching at, at um, Trent met to establish, in other words, to double down on their teaching, their false theology, the teachings of purgatory, and also even of um, transubstantiation, which is they believe that at the communion service, the bread is literally transformed or changed into the actual body and blood of Jesus Christ. So these, the Bible never teach that. The Bible says that it is an emblem, not the real, you know, but the Catholic Church says, no, it is the real. So these are number, uh, uh, together with Sunday, of course, we talk about Sunday of the world, number of tenants, doctrinal tenants, that the Council of Trent confirmed and endorsed. And it was further, um, it was, you know, and, and very interesting, permit me to say this, that the Catholic Church curse and pronounce a malediction on every church that will not adhere or agree with their teachings. And they condemn right salvation, justification by faith. They say, they say that salvation by faith, by grace through faith was heresy. And they, they condemn it. They say it is anathema. And they have not revoked. They have not revoked that statement from the Council of Trent to this very day. If you could just repeat that for the audience one more time, please. The Catholic Church, the Council of Trent, pronounced a curse on every Protestant church that embraced the doctrine of justification by faith. Sola fede. They condemn it and they say it is heresy. And they say it is anathema, which means that it is heresy, it is a curse. And they have not revoked that statement to this very day. So to those Protestant churches who think that they can be in, lie down in the same theological bed with the Catholic Church are making a cataclysmic mistake because you can never be friend to, to a system that has outrightly and openly reached. In fact, Protestants were burned alive. They were killed. They were maimed. They were arrested. They were put in jail. They were ostracized for life for holding on to the doctrine of justification by faith, which is what the Bible teaches, that man is saved by grace through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. So the Catholic Church don't believe in that. They believe in works righteousness. And, and to be clear, and to be clear, you are not condemning an individual person. You're talking about a system of belief that go in contrast to the scripture. Is that clear? That is absolutely correct. And, um, you know, the, the Catholic Church stands behind every word, you know, they say. In fact, the declaration and anathemas of the Council of Trent have never been revoked. Let me repeat that. The decrees of the Council of Trent are confirmed by both the Second Vatican Council in 1962 and 1965, and the official catechism of the Catholic Church was ratified in 1992, recently, and affirmed the same statements. So they still affirm the statement. So Absolutely. again, we're not talking about an individual person. We're talking about a system that has a set of belief that's run counter to the Bible. And we are, we, what we're saying on this show, we are here to highlight the scripture over tradition. And the Bible advises us to stick to what thus say the Lord and not tradition. Uh, am, I, am I being clear in what you're trying to convey to us? Jesus said it. He says, search the scriptures. For in them you shall have life eternal, for these are they which testify of me. Praise God. With that being said, is there a question or a statement from anyone in the audience? I want to I wanna go to Matthew chapter 24 and verses 
three, 23 and 24, a passage that you have, you have shared with us, Pastor. Again, Matthew chapter 24, verses 23 and 24. And he says, and this is Jesus speaking now. That if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, and there believe it not. Verse 24. For there shall arise false Christ and false prophets, and shall shew great signs and mm -hmm. wonders in so much that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. And Pastor, in terms of what you share with us about tradition versus scripture, how is this passage now applicable to the, what you're trying to present to us? Well, it, this passage you just read by Jesus has struck the, the axe right at the root of the tree of human tradition because people tend to embrace popularism at the expense of losing their soul salvation and the reason why popularism I and mean, when you look at in the political arena what happened recently there was a particular gentleman who continued to lie People stopped counting the amount of lies he made, thousands of statements that were non-factual. But in spite of that, millions of people, millions of people, educated people, academic people, embraced him. And that's exactly what Jesus is saying. Imagine, you know, things have not changed. In the religious world, same thing. Jesus says, many people will be deceived if it was not for the elect for the elect sake so we are talking about i mean people will see you will explain you will show people clearly from the bible saturday is the sabbath sunday is not the sabbath they will look at it they say yes i see it but i still don't want to accept it you will show them clearly from the word of god <clears throat> the true mode of baptism by immersion not sprinkling they will look at it and they will still say, I still don't accept it. You will show them clearly from the scriptures, from the word of God, that um, the dead cannot be prayed to. The dead cannot receive our uh, love, our concern and everything. They will look at it, they will see it, and they will still say, I reject it. You will present to people all of the tenets of scripture that points clearly to what ancient prophets, the disciples, preach and believe. And you will show them where, how human tradition has contradicted and turned their backs on the holy scriptures. They will look at it, read it, and they will say, we don't embrace it we don't believe it with that being said is there a question from someone or a statement does good evening i do have a question please proceed has anyone approached the catholic church and informed them of uh the Council of Trent, that it is incorrect and it goes against the word of God? Oh, to the contrary, the Catholic Church stood firm to everything that they espouse from the Council of Trent that came from the Council of Trent. And like I mentioned, I said in, um, in the Catechism published the Catechism of Catholic Doctrine published in 1992, they reaffirmed everything that the Council of Trent, uh, that came from the Council of Trent. Now, let us not, let, let me just share with you something. When you ask Protestants, if you believe the Bible and the Bible only, what evidence in scripture do you have for observing Sunday? the first day of the week. 
and not the seventh day Sabbath, which is Saturday. Ask Protestants that question. They will rely on tradition rather than scripture in answering that question. And the Catholic Church says those Protestants who believe the Bible and the Bible only must have some difficulty in explaining why they keep Sunday holy and not the Sabbath Saturday. They said that. And today, unfortunately, there are many um, prominent Protestant leaders who are vehemently uh, supporting and backing uh, traditional claims. And uh, I'm talking about scholars. I'm talking about theologians. I'm talking about men of renown, you know. And they are claiming that, you know, the seven-day Sabbath is not valid. It is not. And they are trying to use the, the notion of righteousness by works. They are saying that when you observe the Sabbath, you are therefore um, espousing to righteousness by works. But Sabbath keeping has nothing to do with righteousness by works. Because we are not observing the Sabbath for the base, on the basis of salvation to be saved. No. Or any law for that matter. Salvation is based upon the merits of Jesus Christ alone. By the way, man kept the Sabbath before they became sinful. Adam before the fall kept the Sabbath because the Sabbath was there before sin. So the Sabbath has nothing to do with salvation because Adam before the fall did not need salvation. And he was observing the Sabbath from creation. Before the fall, the Sabbath was there before the fall. So it throws out of the window the, whole, the notion of keeping the Sabbath based on righteousness by works. It has nothing to do with that. The Sabbath shows the respect and the union that man has with God. It is based upon worship. We come together to worship God on the Sabbath. Praise God. I appreciate that. Great question. Great answer. Is there another question from someone else? Anyone that have was a good question. I appreciate the question. Yeah. Thank you, my sister. Anyone else have a question or a statement? I have a question, Pastor. Please proceed. I was raised, as you know, in several different denominations, and we were taught that Sunday was the day we went to church. Um, as we got older, my stepfather would not even allow us as teenagers to get a job on Sunday because... We were taught that Sunday was a day of rest, and that's when we went to church. We, we wouldn't even clean the house or do chores. So I know this may sound like a dumb question, and I, I hope you'll forgive me. No, no question is a dumb question. We, <laughs> God bless you. Explain to me how, what, what, is, what was the Council of Trent, and how did we go from... How did we go from Saturday being the Sabbath to um, the, you know, Methodist, um, Episcopalian, you, you know, all of these other denominations came to Sunday being our day of worship? How did that mm -hmm. happen again? Well, you know, even before the Council of Trent, because the Council of Trent came in the 15, the, the 1500s, uh, but even before the Council of Trent, uh, you know, the, the, the word Protestant came from the concept of protesting against the mother church, which was the Catholic church. So there were some men and women who stood up from Wycliffe to Huss to Jerome, all of the reformers, they stood against the mother church because they saw that the mother church was teaching doctrines that contradicts the Bible. So they protested. That's how they got the name Protestants. They protested. Out of that movement came Lutheranism after Martin Luther, who was one of the leading um, Protestants. Um, Baptist, because of the doctrine they believe that people should be baptized by immersion and not by sprinkling of infants or babies. Um, the others who 
followed that uh, um, like the the Methodist John and Charles Wesley looking at the methodology, the proper method of biblical doctrine, um, all the other you know Anglican after the Church of England, because the the King of England decided to dis disregard a particular papal injunction, and therefore the Catholic Church in England became the Church of England Anglican. So you find all of these came from the Protestant Reformation movement. So we now, as Seventh-day Adventists, I don't, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist pastor, minister, so we are part of Protestantism because we are still protesting. In fact, the presentation this evening is a form of protesting. We are still declaring and exposing the false teachings or the teaching strata that contradicts the Bible, contradicts the scriptures. So you find that um, when you grew up and was born and raised in a Catholic church, and when you got to age, you begin to realize that, um, you know, you were not baptized the proper way because an infant uh, it cannot be baptized because baptism must follow conversion. Uh, and sprinkling is not the method of baptism that was presented in the New Testament. Uh, you realize, you come of age, you come to realize that you should not confess your sins to a priest, but to Jesus Christ, who is the heavenly high priest, who is faithful and just, Paul says, to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You come of age to come to realize that you should not pray to the dead, for the dead know not anything. You come to the age to realize that um, there's no such thing as the immortality of the soul. So all those doctrines, which, by the way, I stated earlier, came from the apocryphal books, the non-biblical books, the non-canonical books. These are the books that the Catholic Church heavily rely on in order to extract and to propagate and to teach those false teachings and those false doctrines. And so therefore, you have done the correct thing. May God bless you. Continue to study, continue to come on this platform so that you'll continue to be enlightened from the word of God. Is your question been answered? I do understand that sometimes when there's so much information, sometimes you don't get the gist fully. But if you, do you have a follow-up question to Sasara? No, I just, it, it, wow, um, I can't find the words. Um, I am enjoying so much learning about um, the Seventh-day Adventists and the way that they approach the Bible and the way that they live their life. And um, I just wanted to make sure that I was following along correctly and understood what what he meant. Great. So he, he, he answered my question, and I sincerely appreciate that because I'm finding that um, the Seventh-day Adventist is more true to the Bible than in any of the denominations of which I've been a part of. God bless you, Sister Sarah. I truly appreciate your honest um, desire to search and to find the truth because the Bible says you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. And I want to let you know that I was not born and raised Seventh-day Adventist. I was born and raised Catholic. I was in the Catholic Church. I was an altar boy. And I used to, you know, dress in the cassock and the soap place and to follow the priest and perform the mass and the rituals and everything like that until I began to question the doctrines of the church and i begin to ask the priest questions and the priest told me plainly that the church tradition is more important than the holy scriptures and i was shocked i was amazed i was astonished for the priest to have told me that and so then i told him listen um you know i would rather follow the scriptures i would follow the word of god and amazingly the catholic priest told me that if you choose to follow the Bible above the Catholic Church, you have chosen to do the right thing. <laughs> so, Pastor, please explain that one more time because I, 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 I know I heard what you said. Yeah, and, and by the way, and by the way, my father was one of the uh, pillars of the Catholic Church, and the, another priest told my father the same thing after I became a Seventh Day Adventist. My father went 
to another priest and told the priest, ask the priest the same question, because my father was puzzled when I began to show him from the Bible um, the correct mode of baptism. Jesus was baptized in the River Jordan by immersion. The John the Baptist baptized him that way, and the disciples followed the same pattern. I showed him that sprinkling of babies of infants is not the correct mode of baptism. I showed him from the scriptures that the seventh day Sabbath, Saturday is the Sabbath. Luke, Luke um, 24, 54, the Bible says Christ died on the Friday evening. And after the death of Christ on the cross, the day came, the evening, the Sabbath began Friday evening. I showed him, when my father read that and he showed, he went back to the priest and the priest told him, listen, what your son have showed you in the Bible is correct. Same thing he told me. Now there are some honest priests, some honest um, pro pro Protestant who would admit to you, they will admit to you that the seventh day Sabbath Saturday has not changed. They will admit to you that they know that there is no such thing as purgatory. It is not in scripture. They would admit to you um, other components and tenets of scripture. But because of tradition, they want to please their family. They want to please their friends. They want to please their loved ones. And of course, the convenience the convenience of doing whatever you want to do on Saturday. You know, I mean, you, you, you go to the mall, you go to shopping, you go everywhere on Saturday. You don't have to pay attention to the Sabbath observer at all. So human tradition pats you on the shoulder. Human tradition makes you feel comfortable. Human tradition makes you feel at ease with yourself. And I see Pastor Lightbird is watching, is listening. Human tradition is more readily accepted among people Popular Protestantism, human tradition, man, is a big thing. It is known as popularism. And popularism, you will come with all the lies. You will come with all the different things. People will embrace it. Why? Because it's easy. And here's what Jesus says. Wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be that go in their right. But the way to eternal life, Jesus says, is narrow. It is narrow. But few there be that enter in. But the difference between the broad road and the narrow road is the narrow road is straight, but the broad road is crooked. Praise God. Praise God. And all good things must come to an end. And with that, we want to transition to the end of the show. Pastor, whenever you come to this show, it has always been a revelation to me and to many of us. And so we just want to thank you for your discipline in spending time uh, to study the Word of God. Last night, Pastor Baba Najad was here, and I, I asked him a question uh, based upon Luke chapter Two verse 52 and the text says Jesus grew and increased both in statue and in wisdom with God and his fellow man so in answer in answering my question he took me to Luke chapter 2 46 and 47 and in 46 and 47 it showed that Jesus at 12 years old spent time to study the scripture and because he spent time to study the scripture he was able to have a conversation with the scholars of the scripture then. And so because you have spent time with your God and you have spent time reading the scripture, you were able to make clear to us even complicated passage in the scripture. Praise God. And you have spent time with God, the Holy Spirit, and as such, God have blessed you. And for this, we say thank you. We give God the praise and the glory. Thanks for having me and to the listening audience um i pray that you'll continue to walk in the path of righteousness yes and 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 for that we're asking you know to pray for us we we're asking the, there are many needs among us and as our faces differ so our, our various needs and wants some of us have financial issue mm -hmm. some of us are sick in our bodies yes. uh, some of us are concerned about our family but also i want for you to pray for the truth that you have just presented to us, okay. that God may work upon our hearts so we may come to ac accept the truth because we know in and for ourselves we cannot do it. And so we want, we, will pray, we want to pray that God's Spirit will penetrate our hearts, 
that the truth that you have taught through the Holy Spirit will take residence in our hearts. Our gracious Heavenly Father, this evening on this platform, we want to take the time out to thank you. While the world is uh, involved in rival, rob, rival way and um, in, in acts of, of violence and in acts of greed and in acts of um, iniquity, we have decided to and chosen to be with you in the study of your word. We pray, O oh God, that you will minister to our needs. And our needs vary They're different just as our faces and characters are different. Lord, but we need your divine help. And we are not, we, 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 are, we, we are telling you, we are asking with humility, O oh Lord God, that you will minister to us, show us your divine favor. Touch us with your healing power. You have done it before. You can do it again for you are the same God yesterday and forever. Just like blind Bartimaeus called upon you, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. That's what he prayed, and you answered him. I'm asking you to have mercy upon each one of us, everyone who is sick, different maladies, cancer, um, diabetes, um, inflammation, um, brain tumor, upper respiratory problem, glaucoma, herring problem, uh, digestive problem, lung problem breathing problem, uh, heart disease and heart conditions, liver problem, uh, viruses, illnesses, uh, conditions in the reproductive system, fibroids, hemorrhoids, uh, all the conditions that are debilitating to the human body. You are the physician. We pray that you'll touch even those who are suffering from spiritual, mal spiritual issues and spiritualistic attacks. Um, I pray that you will set your people free for you came to set the captives free. Release and dismiss and, 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 and remove um, your people from all satanic entrapments. And that you will break the chains that hold us bound. For you came to bind the strong man of the house so that you will set the captives free. So we invoked your presence and your blessings your power and your deliverance upon each of us tonight. We claim healing in the name of Jesus. All the names that have been issued and mentioned and listed nightly, blessed from the, from the youngest, the oldest among us, and bless this platform, bless this ministry, and bless everyone who listened this evening. May our hearts be transformed by your love and by your truth, for we shall know the truth and the truth shall set us free. Sanctify us through thy truth. Thy word is true. And may we experience salvation full and free in jesus name we pray amen 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 pastor again and be off of all of us near and far for those who are listening on the various social media platforms we just want to thank you uh, for rightly divided the word of truth and for a wider audience want to let you know that we're here seven days a week Every day. Every day from 6 to 7.30 p.m. So we just yeah. want to ask you to join us tomorrow again. We are committed to lift up Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We are God committed to lift up Jesus keep Christ. Up, up, and up, our objective is to make whatever we say on this show, we want to make sure it is, is Bible-based, it's biblical, it's Christ-centered. And irrelevant to our life. Again, whatever we say upon this show, we want you to help to hold us accountable. Make sure that what we say, we can prove it from Scripture, number one. Number two, we want you to hold us accountable to make sure that what we're saying is Christ-centered. And number three, we want to make sure that it's relevant to your life and my life, your struggle and my struggle. Those three things I want for you to hold us accountable on the show. God bless you. And if you hold us accountable, and if we follow through and making sure that what we're saying is biblical, it's Christ-centered, and is relevant to our struggle, then we are saying to you now, it is time for us to make a decision to, to adhere to what God is saying through us. Again, Pastor, on behalf of all of us, and to a wider audience and local audience, we want to thank you for joining us. We shall be here tomorrow again.
Hello, my name is Pastor Owen Bonaby, President of Final Shout Television and Social Media Network. Final Shout's objective is to join hands and hearts with our fellow men, holy angels, and God himself in sharing God's redemptive love with the entire world. That Jesus is the creator of the world, the sustainer of the world, the Redeemer of the world, and that Jesus has promised us He will come back to receive us unto Himself. Please join our mission in reaching 2 billion people with God's redemptive love in three ways, with your time, your giftedness, and your resource. First, with your time. Watch and share Final Shout 24-7 anywhere in the world on the following platforms. Final Shout on Ruka TV. Final Shout on Fire TV. Final Shout TV on Apple TV. Social media such as Facebook or Meta. YouTube, Twitter. Download or Android and Apple phone apps. Or you can watch us 24-7 on our website. Watch.fanashout.org Second, with your giftedness. Become Fana Shout's show producer, director, contributor, host, hostess, or you can tell us of your giftedness and how you would like to serve. Third, with your resource. Support Final Shout financially. Become Final Shout's 12 Stars Club member, which help with our monthly operations budget. Two, become a sponsor of a show or sponsor a series of shows. Both individuals and businesses can be sponsors. And three, choose our merchandise. Thank you in advance for your prayerful consideration in joining our mission in reaching two billion people with God's redemptive love. As the joy of the Lord is Final Shout's strength. Wallace Muffler. Our motto, you bring it, we fix it. Wallace Muffler's services. Here at Wallace Muffler, we offer a wide range of services and repairs. With over 37 years of experience that you can trust and count on for all your vehicle's health needs. We practice proactive car health maintenance and prompt repair service. Specializing in mufflers, brakes and any mechanical issue. You bring it, we fix it. Services we offer are air and cabin filter, air conditioning, battery, body and trim, brake service and repair, brakes, check engine light and diagnostic, electrical, exhaust, oil change, Steering and suspension, transmission, and tires. Here at Wallace Muffler, we promise 100% customer satisfaction guaranteed. Same day service for most repairs. Work is done right the first time. Call us here at Wallace Muffler for an appointment at 203 8 Five zero three two five three, or visit us at three seven nine Walton Street, 
Hamden, Connecticut, 06517. See you there. Taj Realty, make your dreams a reality. Taj Real Estate LLC is a full-service firm specializing in commercial and residential properties, short sale, sale and marketing of existing homes, condos, and rentals, FHA 203K sales, and first-time home buyers, investor purchase, and mortgage. We offer mortgages for investors and commercial clients. Non-owner occupant, no income, self-employed, low income. Let us guide you to the neighborhood that's a fit for you. If you're looking for a starter, a first-time home, a cottage, a vacation home, Colonial, a city comfort. Suburban, a hidden tranquility. Luxury, a lifestyle. Chateau, a modern French style. Even a waterfront beauty. Or, if you're interested in commercial investments, a strip mall shopping center, hotel, city high-rise, storefront, commercial shop space, office space, business place. Whether it's commercial or residential, whether you're looking for a mortgage, buying, selling, or renting. Taj is just a call away. Do you have a question? Come in person and experience our full service at 630 Dixwell Avenue, New Haven, Connecticut 06511 or visit us on the web tajrealestatellc.com. A call away. Call today. Call 203 691 1385.